Good morning. It is good to be with you again. Um, this is my uh, sixth and sadly last Sunday with you um, <laughs> until I start going back to church with my girls. So, you know, bittersweet. Um, I've had a I've had a lovely placement with you. Um, it's been lovely to get to know you. Um, and yes, I'm happy to say. I have had no gremlins in my computers this week, so we are all uh, we're all all happy here. Um, yes, I am going to read a couple of the lines of our opening hymn as uh, as our call to worship today. Come, thy fount of every blessing. We ask our Father to come and tune my heart to sing thy grace. As a guitarist, that word, that line always hits me hard. Tune my heart. I am an instrument, I need tuning, or otherwise I sound awful. There's streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Come with boldness, come with faithfulness, come to worship this morning. Here I raise my Ebenezer. You have that on a, on a wee rock in your, in your vestibule porch. Here by thy great help I've come. Look back with 2020 hindsight vision on the goodness of your God. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, and he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. As we sing these songs, may they speak to us, may they preach to us, as we sing songs that have been sung by generations of Christians before us, but they are still just as true to us today. God our Father be with us this morning. May we bring you praise, may we bring you glory, may we understand you just a little bit more. Amen. We're going to sing Come Thy Fount.
Do the children want to come up to the front? I have... Do you want to take a wee seat at the... Um, I've forgotten the word for that thing. A pew. There you go. There you go. It's funny how words disappear from your head sometimes, isn't it? There we go. Right. Oh, now, I think we've done well, because I think I see three good, strong people here who can help me with this. Now, we are talking about something. Is this going to work for me? Yeah, there you go. Worry. Right. Do you know what it is to be worried? Do you get it? Do you understand it? Now, the people behind you, all the bigger ones, they're like, oh yeah, I've got all that. I understand worry. But when we're a child, we don't always get it, which is a good thing. Do you have any examples? When times you were worried? Anything that worries you now? No examples? You're all a wee bit young for like big exams, aren't you? Yeah, you're not quite there yet. Okay. Right, I need a volunteer then. So, who's going to volunteer? Good job. Up you come. You look. You ready for this? Right. Are you ready? Yeah. You're going to eat some bugs. What? You eat some bugs. What? You worried? Yeah. No? <laughs> Sounds like someone who would actually eat bugs. That's good. You're not eating bugs. Don't worry. Right. How strong do you think you are? I don't know. You don't know? Well, my dad is. Your dad is strong. Well, let's see if them genes have passed on to you. Right, you put this on. Okay. Right, get it nice and tight. Can you pull these? Okay. You get, oh, hold on. Oh. Do you know, I probably should have made this fit not me before I did this, but we all live and learn, don't we? Right, are you ready? Here, I'm gonna get that one all tight. Right, do you wanna put the, um, put your wee, there's a wee clip there at the front? Where? No, here. Do you wanna try to get that on? You might want it. So, okay. You ready? Feel like you can climb Mount Everest now? Yeah. Mount Everest? Big mountain, very cold at the top. Lots of people die. Right. I, as many of you are aware, I'm applying to go into the ministry, which means I'm going to go to college and I'm going to start learning again, back to school, right? It's a big worry. But I've got a couple of things I might need. It's a good starting point. Right? You ready? This is my Bible. It's a big Bible. I left a little one at home on purpose. Okay. I might need some other things. I found the biggest book I could find in my library. Right? It's nice and heavy, don't know it. Right. You think you can carry that for a bit for me? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put it in the bag, though. Okay. All right. Are we ready? Oh. Let's see how this goes. Ooh. Is it a wee bit heavy? Okay. Do you want a wee book next or a big book? Do you think you go another big book? Okay. Another big book. She's brave, right? We're Presbyterians. Westminster Confession of Faith. That's probably going to be helpful. There we go. How's that? Still light. Still light? Here, there we go. Right. Let's go for a systematic theology then. That's always a big book. How's that? Still light? Oh my. Whew. The Institutes of the Christian Religion. How's that sound? I'm running out of big books. How's that? Still light. Okay, do you want to, can you do a squat? What? Can we do, do a squat? That might make it heavier. No. <laughs> now, I think I will sing songs. Thank you very much. Oh. How's that? Good. Good? Right. I don't have any big books left. Here's a small book. I was expecting this to, uh, not to go as uh, go like this. There we go. How's that? Good. Good? Okay. We're really going for the straw that breaks the camel's back here. Right. Jonathan Edwards. Some good stuff in there. Some of this will worry you. No? Okay. I have one more book. Here you go. It's a book on preaching. That might help. How's that? Still, that's okay. Still okay? Oh, there you go. You can stand there for a bit then. 
So, this is a burden. The burden for me is that this isn't going the way I thought it would. A burden? A burden, it means a heavy back on, or a heavy bag on your back, okay? Something heavy to carry. Worry often feels like this, that you have something heavy to carry. Do you want to walk around the, the lectern a bit? Get some steps in? What's that? This is the lectern. Do you want to do a couple of steps? Yeah. Right? Ooh. Okay. You walk normal? See how, see how normal you can walk? Oh, we're not going to fall over. Okay, that's fine. But worry feels like this. Now, this was supposed to go, that's really heavy. I don't like holding that, is how that was supposed to go. So, worry feels like this, okay? But then God comes down and he says, would you like me to carry that? Would you like me to carry that bag? Yeah. Yeah? That's the right answer. Well done. Right. <laughs> Take your clip off. Oh, you're so strong! Oh, right. Thank you. Oh. So God comes along and says, I will carry that. So when we're worried, it feels like a big burden. This was supposed to demonstrate falling over, not being able to go on, but I picked the strong person at the front. Do you know what pride is. No? Well, you said, yes, you would like me to carry that. Pride is when we say, no, I've got this myself. Right? You could walk around, strut, I'm wearing this bag, I can do it, I am strong enough on my own. You did very good at giving up your worry to God. I'm going to read Matthew in chapter 6, just the second half of it. This is from the children's version. So it says, So I tell you, don't worry about the food you need to live, and don't worry about the clothes you need for your body. Life is more important than food, and the body is more important than clothes. Look at the birds in the air. They don't plant, they don't harvest, they don't store food in barns, but you're fa Heavenly Father feeds the birds, and you are worth more than the birds. You cannot add any time to your life by worrying about it. And why do you worry about clothes? Look at the flowers of the field. See how they grow. They don't work. They don't make clothes. But I tell you that even Solomon, with all his riches, was not dressed as beautifully as one of these flowers. God clothes the grass in the field like that. Living today and tomorrow it's thrown in the fire. So you can be even more sure that God will clothe you. Don't have so little faith. Don't worry. Don't say, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? All the people who don't know God keep trying to get these things. And your Father in heaven knows that you need them. The birds and the flowers. Jesus gives you two reasons and one promise. And I want you to try to remember that. Reason one, the birds. Reason two, the flowers. It's quite easy. Okay? The promise is, I love you more than the birds and the flowers, and I look after them. So, when you feel a bit older and you start getting a bit more worried and a bit more stressed, Jesus comes and says, I love you more than the birds and the flowers, and I look after them. I am going to have everything you need. Then Jesus says, how we're going to do that? Because it's all well and good him saying do that. Then he says, how? He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, I tried to do a memory verse last time I was here, and I didn't put it on the screen. This time I have. So we're going to do a memory verse again. Are you ready? I'm going to say three, two, one. Then we're going to read it. We're going to say Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, because that's the bit we all get kicked up on. 
do we say verse and chapter? I think this, because I've written it on, we're going to say it as it's written. Okay? So one, two, three. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We try again. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So, you go into your week, you go into your life, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God promises everything else he's got. We're going to sing your praise. Which is funny enough, based off this verse. Yes. kids now. announcements for this morning. We're really looking forward to our church family uh, evening next Saturday, that is the 24th of February. Thanks to everyone who has signed up. And just a reminder that uh, we meet at 6 p.m. at Island McGee Community Centre for food, fun and fellowship. And then uh, an announcement regarding the PW. The PW service is on Sunday the 3rd of March. And we're hoping to have a ladies choir to lead the praise. All ladies are welcome in the choir, regardless of whether you attend PW or not. We will have a practice in the church next Sunday, the 25th of February, at 3 p.m., and all ladies are welcome. 
And my understanding is you're not going to be singing a, a, a piece on your own. It's just to lead us all in worship. The PW March meeting is a two-course meal in the Fuzzy Beak restaurant. Again, all ladies are welcome. It's planned for Wednesday the 13th of March at 6 p.m. and the cost is 24.50. If you would like to sign up and make menu choices, please speak to Caroline Smith. And of course, Janet Long would like all money paid to her by the 6th of March. Many thanks. That's from the PW. And then a few other um, announcements for the, not this week, but the following week. Tuesday week, the 27th, um, we have our monthly prayer meeting in the long room at 7.30 p.m. And everyone is welcome to that. And we do appreciate encouragement uh, for our church family. There will be a church committee meeting on Thursday the 29th at 7.30 p.m. in London Halls. So the committee is meeting on the 29th at London. And then I have an announcement about the World Day of Prayer. <clears throat> this year, the, uh, the uh, program for the World Day of Prayer has been prepared by the Christian women of Palestine. And as June said to me earlier, dear knows how or where those women who prepared that and what their condition is at the moment. And so we do pray for them as we use their words to uh, praise God. It's in Whitehead Presbyterian Church at 8 p.m. Uh, and uh, all on the, sorry, my apologies, on the 1st of March. Sorry, it's so obvious on this announcement, I can't see it. Friday the 1st of March at 8 p.m. Uh, in Whitehead Presbyterian Church in King's Road. And everyone is welcome. It's not just for women. And then finally, I want to thank Ben uh, for being with us this morning. I want to thank him for the work that he has been doing over the last six weeks and to assure him that we will continue to pray for him as he pursues uh, his application for ministry. But God bless you, Ben. Over to you. Thank you very much. We're going to um, come to the Lord in prayer. Uh, yes. First Peter 5 and verse 7. Cast all your anxieties, all your cares, and all your worries on him because he cares for you. Our loving Father and our sovereign God, we bring you praise. You are the one who sits in the heavens. You are the one enthroned on high. You are the one who has storehouses of snow. We recognize who we are in comparison to you. But Father, we marvel that we get to call you Abba. Thank you for this access that we have to you. In the wake that is gone, we have all sinned. We have all done wrong. We have all not acted in a way that brings your name the glory that it is due. Now we bring our confessions and our sorries to you. God of forgiveness, we praise you. Make us holy like you. Father, we thank you for this congregation. We thank you for the new life in it, that we can rejoice and we can 
laugh and smile and um, be so happy for. We thank you for um, open churches, that we can be open, that we do not have to close our doors. But we thank you, God, for the boldness that you've instilled into us to be open to our communities, to invite them in. May we also go out with your word. Give us opportunities this week, we pray, to tell more of your name, to tell more of your salvation. Lord, we ask for healing of our sick. We ask for comfort of our elderly. Bring your Holy Spirit near to those who need. Heal the sickness that we have going on. Thank you for um, the hospitals that we have so close to us. The quality of care that we can get. We thank you that you have put us in a place where we have easy access to those things. We bring to you our brothers and sisters um, in other parts of the world, as mentioned there, um, the ladies of Palestine, people who do not have access so quickly to healthcare. God, you are good. We are your children. Amen. Now, Margaret is going to come and do our reading. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? 
For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. We're going to sing um, as the deer pants for water. We are working our way through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as it is recorded in Matthew's Gospel. Peter started you with the Beatitudes, that is, portraits of who the Christian is and how the Christian should be marked by humility. Then we talked about salt and light. These are images to show us how we are to act in the world. We are to be distinctive and illuminating. Uh, Then at the end of chapter 5, Jesus gives us his exposition of the law with specific ways that Christians are to deal with each other and other people in the community. He doubles down on the law um, when he's talking about it and how Christians should visibly act isn't enough. He goes one step further. He makes it internal. Um, Adultery isn't just Sleeping with someone else is having lust in your heart towards somebody. Um, Murder is no longer actually killing somebody. It's it's having anger um, and and wicked thoughts. Then in the first half of Matthew 6, Jesus talks about how we should deal with God in our personal piety. How we should give, how we should pray, and how we should fast. These are three things that could be flashy. They are three things that can be quite showy. But Jesus says three times when talking about them. Your father who sees in secret 
Jesus' command on these is to become more private so that we don't get our reward from others. And that brings us to today's reading. The second half of Matthew 6, Jesus starts to give us mindset advice. Rather than prescription actions regarding lust and oaths and prayer, because he's already dealt with your private life, he's now interested in your public life. Jesus begins to talk about how to live rather than how to act in certain circumstances. He has two ways of living, two mindsets that you can choose from. And then he has three points where you make that choice. Three points where you have to choose which way will you live. I have labelled these heart, eyes and hand. So firstly, heart, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your heart? Where is the thing that you treasure most? I remember watching a TV show, and this character had this ability to ask, what do you most desire? And then people would answer with complete and unabashed honesty. Then he went and used what they said to, you know, bend these purse apps to his will. Um, but if I was to ask you, what do you most desire? What do you think your answer would be? Do you think you'd be honestly able to say with our catechism, it's to make God's glory most known and to enjoy him forever? Or would you be more likely wanting enough money to pay off your mortgage and maybe have a wee holiday? Would you say, give me fame, give me a new car, give me freedom from work so that I can go travel? None of these are bad things. They are good gifts from a good creator. But Jesus here is saying, treasure me, the creator, not the things that I create. He gives us a good reason too. In verse 20, everything else comes and goes. Moth and rust destroy, thieves steal. There's no command against having personal property or against savings. There's actually a command to make savings. In Proverbs 6, uh, 68, we see, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, we're told, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. See, we are to enjoy the good gifts that our Creator, Father, gives us. The good created gifts from our good Creator, Father. Again, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, who forbade marriage and who required abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything is created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. So if treasure on earth is the selfish accumulation of goods or the desire for selfish accumulation, even if you're not able to actually selfishly acclumulate things we then have to ask what treasure in heaven is and I suggest two things 1 Corinthians 13 and 13 that lovely little passage we have on love says faith, hope and love abide they will remain always that is the character of the Christian and I would say a second thing is that any work that produces salvation in others more people built in to the kingdom to come. Second is the eye, reading from verse 22. 
The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then if the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? As the old children's chorus goes, be careful, little eyes, what you see. We get this idea from the world, from the the fitness and um, food bloggers. They say, you are what you eat. They're not wrong. What you consume has a direct impact on the person that you are and what you look like. This is as true for food as it is true for what you watch or where you put yourself. If your eyes are on this world and the pleasures of it, then that will be how you critique your own actions. So where will you fix your eyes? Because that is where you aim. Got a wee experiment for you. Next time you're driving your car, when it's safe to do so, put your hands at 10 and 2, and don't look straight ahead. You'll look. you start veering. You'll end up in the hedgerows. David in Psalm 119 and verse 6 says, Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. Remember the story of Peter walking on water? What happened when he took his eyes off his Lord? He began to drown. Where you fix your eyes will affect your whole life. I wear glasses to fix my physical vision. I need God's word to fix my spiritual vision. And thirdly, hands, reading from verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. What are you working your life for? As I said earlier, there's no prohibition against money or personal property. But this is a question of submission. In the two previous choices, Jesus asks where to store treasure and where to aim. Your answer to those two choices will show you who your master is. God should take a part of your whole life, not just an hour on Sunday mornings. I'm married to a lovely Sharon and I have two beautiful little girls uh, so I am outnumbered in my household. But I can't have two wives. I wouldn't be able to love both wholly. I wouldn't be able to give all of my love, all of my devotion to two. I stood in front of a church And I made vows to God that I would love Sharon and Sharon only. If I was to go out and get a girlfriend, or maybe not even a girlfriend, but a girl who who took part of my life that was I had given in vows to Sharon, then she would be very rightfully so annoyed and jealous. And I hope you all would condemn me for my actions. I hope you would all say, Ben, that's not right. When you submit to God, you don't get to put anything else near his throne. But why? What's the point of all this? Why should I make a choice between these two things? And why should I choose Jesus' way? Well, I don't know if you you know the old wee, what's the therefore, therefore statement. But when we are reading scripture and it says that, you always have to look and say, what's it there for? Reading from verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what will you put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your Father in heaven feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of your life? Why are you so anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown in the oven, will he not so much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles think, seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. There is two ways to live. And the creator of this world, the creator who made you, he knows your innermost parts. He knows how you work. He has given you a way to live. His way. If your treasure is in heaven, if your eyes are on the things of God, and if your hands are serving one master, you will have no need to worry. Jesus gives us two reasons. Firstly, he says it doesn't make sense. He appeals to logic. And which of you, in verse 27, by being anxious, can add a single R to his span of life. Any studies we have done shows that worry decreases your life. A constant state of anxiety. You live shorter from it. But secondly, Jesus' second reason is that God looks after his own. He tells you, rely on the promises I have given. Verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he so much, not so much more clothe you? O you of little faith. Worry is incompatible and inconsistent with faith. You didn't make yourself. You don't keep yourself alive. God is already taking care of the larger issues We can trust him to look after the littler issues. God is not just your creator, but he is your father. Later, Jesus asks, will a good father withhold bread and give a stone? God is just the creator of birds and flowers. You are something of his desire. You are his child. See, my Lexi, that's my three and a half year old, she doesn't worry about where her next meal is coming from because she knows it's my job to feed her. It's my job to clothe her. If she came up to me worried saying, Daddy, we, we can't eat. Where, where are we gonna, there's no food. We can't do this. We have to go and we have to go get this. I can, with full assurance, tell her of the cupboards of food in the house of which I can make her dinner. We are called to have this childlike faith. When Jesus tells us God has storehouses, we can trust him because of who Jesus is. And when Jesus tells you, I go to prepare a place for you, you can trust him because of who he is. But this doesn't mean we get to do nothing. We are to plan for the future, but not to worry about the future. We are not called to sit back on porch swing chairs and saying, God has it all. I need do nothing. Proverbs 16 and verse 9 says, The heart of man plans his way, but it is the Lord who establishes his steps. Don't be lazy. The birds, they build their nests, and early birds get worms. Flowers aren't idle. They spend all day taking in carbon and doing photosynthesis. Paul tells us in 2 Ephesians in chapter 3, 
For even when we were with you, would we not give you this command? If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And in Proverbs in chapter 12, it says, Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. We are not given a freedom from work, a freedom from responsibility, a freedom from our duty to care for others, or even a freedom from troubles in this life. But we are promised a freedom from worry. The world has somehow made worry into this virtue. That when you're worried, you're working lots. You have so much on your plate because you have so much responsibility, and that's good. It's just a sign that, that you're working really hard. They have twisted the curse of worry into something that makes you worthy of attention or personal and prideful glory. So how do we do this then? Well, Jesus sums it up in verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. We sang the children's chorus, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Christian, you are called to seek God's rule and God's righteousness. Repent, submit, and believe. Can you live your life in a way that gives God just a little bit more glory? Is there a choice you can make that will give God just a little bit more glory? Then do that. If this is your genuine ambition, then God promises that he will meet your needs. A good tool for this is 2020 hindsight. Those of you with more years than me will probably attest to this stronger than I can, but God in his grace has given me some experiences too. How many times in a moment have you been blinded by your needs? But when you look back over your life, you look back at your Ebenezers that you have put up, do you see that God has his hands all over your needs? Secondary ambitions are good. When God and his glory are your first ambitions, you can do all your secondary ambitions. Grow your gifts. God gave them to you. Have success. It is good. Push for excellence and enjoy God's wonderful creation. One author, when summarizing, uh, as he summarizes all of the Sermon on the Mount, summarizes this section as, have a single object of trust in the Lord your God. Jesus reminds us that we cannot have more than one true master and we cannot serve both the Lord and money. He underscores why God alone is worthy of our absolute allegiance. For God takes care of his people perfectly. I'm going to close by reading Psalm 23 to you. May this psalm fill you with hope and peace and a desire to do more good work for your good God. The Lord my shepherd, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. We're going to stand to sing. We're going to sing, uh, He will hold me fast. Because He will. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts, your eyes, your hands. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.